Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our next webinar in partnership with Merck, Sharp, and Dom called Lung Cancer in Europe, New Ideas for Policy Action. My name is Dwayne Schultes. I'm the Managing Director of Vital Transformation, and I'd like to thank you all for your participation. Now this year, more than half a million Europeans will be diagnosed with lung cancer. While many countries have improved the management of lung cancer through better prevention, detection, diagnosis, and treatment, the disease continues to claim one in five cancer deaths across Europe, posing significant challenges to patients and healthcare systems. To identify further opportunities for improvement, the Economist Intelligence Unit made a comparative analysis of lung cancer policies across 27 countries. Over the course of 18 months, almost 200 experts provided their insights and advice. And during this webinar, we will discuss the main findings of this new landmark study and discuss the role that governments and policymakers can play in addressing the high burden that lung cancer presents to patients. And I'm joined by an exceptional panel today. Again, it's our fantastic pleasure to have these wonderful speakers. I'd like to start off by introducing MEP Christian Silvio Bissoy, who's the chair of the Intergroup Cancer Challenge in the European Parliament. MEP Bissoy, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you for the invitation and uh, good luck in uh, your activities. <laughs> thank you, sir. We're also joined by MEP Claudia Gammon from the MEPs Against Cancer. MEP Gammon, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. We're also joined by Dr. Mariana Garasino from the National Cancer Institute in Milan, who was also a member of the expert panel for the Economist Intelligence Unit study. Uh, Dr. Garasino, thank you for your participation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, we also have Tommy Bjork from Lung Cancer Europe. Hello, Tommy. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a patient, so I'm uh, the one you speak uh, about, and I have some experiences. I hope I can cont contribute to it. We're very much looking forward to your input, Tommy. Thank you. And last but not least, certainly Mike Morrissey from the European Cancer Organization. Hello, Mike. Thanks, Dwayne. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all. So we look forward to having you here. Now we're going to begin with a question to Christian Silvio Bussoy. Uh, we mentioned the Economist Intelligence Unit report. It mentions that 27 countries studied have 41% have not updated their national cancer control plans in the last five years and 19% do not have a national cancer control plan at all. The report's first recommendation is to recognize that lung cancer needs to be a high priority throughout Europe, develop specific lung cancer plans and improve strategic planning with national cancer plans that include details on implementation and funding. Could you please share your perspective on the work that is ongoing in your own country, Romania, to create a national cancer plan and the inclusion of lung cancer in the European cancer policy, for example, in Europe's Speedy Cancer Plan? Hello again. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, well, the recommendation is uh, totally correct. Uh, it, we cannot make a difference without recognizing uh, the importance and without uh, making cancer uh, a priority and also without the inclusion of lung cancer uh, in European cancer policy. Uh, we uh, uh, have ambitious targets for the next years. We have uh, a strategic uh, uh, target on EU, EU's, Europe's beating cancer plan, which is uh, uh, very much supported by the policymakers, by European Parliament. Uh, uh, I'm also responsible for the new health program, EU for Health. I'm the rapporteur on behalf of the European Parliament. And here, uh, I included uh, the reference to, to cancer, to pediatric cancer, but to cancer in general. And also the EU beating cancer plan could fund part of uh, the activities related to this strategy from uh, the budget of EU for Health, which uh, for the first time in the history of European Union, it's really significant. It's more than 9 billion euros, 9.4 billion is the proposal of European Commission, a 19 times increase uh, from the previous period and also from the initial proposal of European Commission. Uh, it's clear that uh, all member states should uh, uh, build or uh, improve their uh, cancer plans. This is something that should happen in the coming period, starting from the main uh, directions and guidelines settled by uh, the EU plan, Europe's, Europe's uh, beating cancer plan. Romania is uh, one of the countries where uh, Unfortunately, the situation is uh, not the best. Now there is a project uh, funded by European funds from cohesion policy, so those funds which were allocated to Romania in this uh, financial uh, period uh, until the end of the year, 
in order to gather together all the experts, uh, patients associations, also uh, policy makers, academia, medical doctors, in order to build this uh, cancer plan. There are also several uh, initiatives from uh, different NGOs and stakeholders uh, in order to contribute and to come with ideas uh, on a general cancer plan, but also on sectorial. And uh, lung cancer should be seen with uh, uh, a lot of focus because it's one of the cancers that puts uh, a lot of burden. And uh, also there is one of the cancers where we could make a difference. Investing in prevention, most of the cancers are preventable, but uh, of course in the lung cancer, if we invest in prevention, we, if, if we use prevention, uh, uh, screening, early diagnosis, the difference could be extraordinarily uh, clear. And also uh, we already have uh, a lot of uh, treatment alternatives uh, which uh, prove very efficient that should be uh, used and reimbursed and uh, acknowledged by, by the member states. So uh, it's one of the areas where we can really make a difference. And I believe that uh, we should struggle together in order to implement uh, uh, the, the ambitious targets uh, settled already by European Commission. The time is perfect. Health is, uh, is clear a priority. Policymakers, citizens, after also this corona crisis, understand that we should invest more in health. We already took the initiative to concentrate on cancer. We have also the mission for cancer, the, one of the first missions overall and the, the top priority for the next research period. And I was also responsible on behalf of ENVI on the health chapter on the new Horizon Europe. So uh, let's act together. Thank you very much, MEP. Um, a lot of the things you were talking about, particularly regarding diagnosis and new steps, um, these are things that are very close to uh, Professor Garasino's heart. And I, I do wanna ask her a question following this up. Um, Dr. Garasino, thank you again for your participation. Lung cancer is a race against time as we know. However, in the critical guidelines of the EU 27 countries, the EIU report that you participated in, 41% do not include the fast tracking of those suspected of having lung cancer for diagnostic testing. 44% of the countries do not include a specific time frame for obtaining diagnostic testing. And 52% do not include rapid referral for newly diagnosed patients. Now, as a member of the study's expert panel and from your own experience as a thoracic oncologist, can you discuss the importance of fast tracking people for diagnosis and the rapid referral of treatment. What needs to be done to improve timelines across the patient journey? Thank you for, uh, for your question. And I would like also to thank Christian because he said very, very important thing. The first is that uh, maybe I can treat a rare tumor if we invest more in prevention and uh, in a smoking cessation. So this is uh, the first point. But... Uh, what we see now is that uh, lung cancer is still uh, a very uh, important uh, tumor. And uh, the, we, I'm happy that there is also the Lung Cancer Association here because they can uh, witness that in the last five years, uh, we had incredible advances uh, in the treatment, uh, in especially of nosmal cell lung cancer. But uh, this kind of uh, advances uh, are possible if we do a correct diagnosis for our patients. This means that we have to stage very well the patients. So we have to understand where the disease is in every organ. And we must do very quickly because the performance status of these patients can deteriorate in a few weeks. And we have to obtain many characteristics of the tumor, in particular, Maybe you are aware that we found the genomic characteristic of the tumor and we can associate a specific genomic characteristics to a specific drugs. This is more, more frequent in never smoker patients, but is also present also in smoker patients. In the smoker patients, the immunotherapy in the last five years changed the way in, uh, uh, on how we treat lung cancer. PDL1 is one of the tests very important to be performed to understand the sensitivity to immunotherapy. But what it is important that in 2020, we are able to give years of life to our patients if the diagnosis 
uh, is done correctly and is done quickly because sometimes I see that some patients have a diagnosis in two months, three months, and it's too much if we want to uh, exploit all the therapies and everything for our, for our patients. So it is important to have a multidisciplinary team. We, I will come back uh, many times on this concept because if you have a multidisciplinary team you are able to give to have a correct diagnosis for the for the patients and to have a correct diagnosis very quickly for the patients so i think that in the future we have to think and to work around this concept because i i agree that lung cancer is a race against time but is also a race against a good quality. So we have to obtain a good quality if we want to promise years of life to our patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Garasino. Now, Tommy, you mentioned that you were a patient. Um, a couple things reflecting on something that Professor Garasino said about treatment. You know, as a board member of Lung Cancer Europe, you work with lung cancer patient groups across the entire EU. Um, Professor Garasino said that we need to have these specialized team in the various member states, but the report tells us that 44% of the countries studied a lung cancer specific patient organization doesn't exist. Patient organizations are included in the development of clinical guidelines in only eight of the 27 countries and in the health technology assessment process only 15 out of 27 countries. How is Lung Cancer Europe trying to ensure that your voice is ensured in the lung cancer patients is heard included in this decision making across EU member states to implement some of these changes? Yeah, the patient's advocacy is in Europe. It's a rather young thing. When I was uh, sick, uh, my tumor is just as old as uh, the first, uh, the national patient advocacy, 16 years since I got sick. It was the same year. And uh, uh, we are years after the breast cancer and the, or uh, the prostate cancer was developed great organizations and and um, they have done a very good thing we look we're looking at them of course but um, the problem is that uh, it's very hard to start uh, uh, advocacy because people die or people get so sick so they can't work and we have the problem i had a, a, a i've seen so many you my 10 10 years as uh, chairman in, in the national board. I've seen so many people go away. So it's the loss is somebody last week. And, and I'm not, I retired now. I just my last year in, in the lung cancer Europe. But that needs a lot of good efforts from, from the healthcare professionals, a lot from uh, relatives and, and friends to the, to the sick one, the patients themselves, of course. And from politicians and uh, decision makers. All those good uh, things, they had to work together. And I can see that um, the, the, from the polls that's been made the last years, that people, patient doesn't get that same uh, uh, support from the authorities as uh, Mr. Besoa uh, mentioned. It's, it's much tougher for, for uh, patient advocacy in the former East to, to get a start an organization. And we try to help them. And uh, we'll see, we try to have, have one of our annual meetings in Sofia uh, last year. And we had to, to, to kind of through the parliament. I think that's the way to go for us for the moment because we present uh, an uh, report like this uh, terrific report we are discussing now uh, every year to to um, maps against cancer in, in november the lung cancer awareness month where we point out these different things for instance as uh, disciplinary multidisciplinary teams who take the decision about diagnosis for instance and about testing and etc we have a lot of this report there's a new one maybe we're not to come to to <laughs> Result this November, who knows? But we we try to do it digitally, like this webinar, for instance, in some way, to point out what we have found. And this time, it's about 
both awareness and uh, stigma for lung cancer. Yes, and we'll discuss stigma later, but you brought up something that's quite interesting, and that's your interaction with the November meeting of the European Parliament. I'd like to bring in MEP Gammon now. Uh, you know, Claudia, you hosted the last event in the European Parliament last November during Lung Cancer Awareness Month, what Tommy was just discussing, and you did so to raise awareness of lung cancer um, and the heightened need for visibility for the disease and EU policies. As you're a member of the MEPs Against Cancer, can you tell us more about your commitment to making lung cancer specifically an EU political priority within the context of the EU cancer plan and everything we're discussing, please? Um, well, I think um, as Tommy has pointed out, um, myself, like many others, I, I have lost somebody in my family to lung cancer and I believe that many people um, have lost um, family and friends um, to this disease and the more that I researched on what uh, many member states in Europe are not doing um, on, on prevention and, and on prevention and treatment, the more angry I got and um, that um, it would seem um, it, is an, it makes me immeasurably angry to know that there, that there is so much more that could be done and, and could very easily so the main focus of the event was to raise awareness about lung cancer prevention and, and treatments during Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And the idea was to highlight research um, on screening and why uh, this deadliest cancer was not being dealt with better and what the reasons for this could be and what we could change to, to make the situation better. And, um, we, we had MEPs that were interested in the matter. Uh, we had the European Respiratory Society. Um, we had um, representatives for, from the firm reps in Brussels and the commission and Professor Burkuber from Austria, um, who was a speaker. Um, and it was a very, I think, a, for many um, of the people there from this community of policymakers, it was a very important event because for many of us, the amount of money that is being spent on lung cancer prevention, how it uh, compares to how we deal with different cancers where we have a, a system in place that has very much improved the situation, especially in the last 10 to 15 years. If I look at um, the prevention systems on breast cancer, for example, here in Austria, it's very well established. And for me, it was just shocking to hear what we are not doing in the field of lung cancer. So the focus of the event was very much on early screening and detection. And of course, what we in, in Brussels as a community of policymakers um, can do, how we can better use the EU research programs to focus on this topic, what the uh, beating cancer plan could include uh, in this regard. And of course, um, what the, the member states that are responsible for their own um, strategic um, healthcare planning uh, should implement um, in their policies. Because obviously there's only so much the European community can do when it comes to healthcare, obviously. So it was, I think, a very positive start um, for a sort of community building um, for the topic. And my own very strong belief on this field and, and what my group Renew Europe also supports is that um, investing in research and, and keeping your priorities straight when it comes to prevention and treatment is the best way to deal with this. And I think, um, I, um, I think we need to see this as a topic where we have to find a holistic approach that is not, you know, sometimes what happens is you have a thinking in silos where you have the research community and, and you have a focus on treatment and I think it's important to bring all of these aspects together and now we're again in the in the process of uh, negotiating the European budget for the next seven years and research is a huge topic and it's important now in in, in this time during the summer where we are trying to find a deal to negotiate the budget to underline that every euro spent on research is a euro spent on, on saving lives. And this is very much um, important for people to keep repeating the story because 
we tend to lose our focus when it comes to research because obviously you don't see all the all the progress that is being made immediately and it's important to communicate it it's important to communicate the uh, the impact that um, that money spent on research has and in this and i think the event was a positive start for that um, we had we had already been thinking about um, doing um, another round um, at some point in April, which uh, obviously we couldn't do in, in Brussels uh, due to the pandemic. But it won't be the only event that we're hosting on this topic. That's great. Thank you. You mentioned looping this back and bringing these recommendations into the member states. That's really important. I'd, I'd like to drill into that. I have, do have a question for that later, but for the time being, I am going to press forward, although I do want to touch on that before the end. I'd like to bring in Mike Morrissey now. Um, you know, Mike is one of the heads of the European Cancer Organization. Uh, Mike, lung cancer obviously is the leading cause of mortality in Europe. The European Cancer Organization has led the development of essential requirements, key performance indicators for quality cancer care to improve lung cancer treatment. Uh, it's not published yet, but I understand you have a PowerPoint you'd like to present to give us a preview of these requirements. And uh, please walk you through it and I'll bring up the PowerPoint for you now. Yeah, and thanks for the invitation. I think it's a very timely uh, webinar on this topic. And as, as all the panel has already made some extremely important points, some of which are covered in this busy slide, here. Just to say a word about the European Cancer Organization, where I'm CEO, we're a federation, a family of 31 European cancer societies and 20 patient advocacy groups, including uh, Lung Cancer Europe, which uh, is represented today by Tommy. So we are a group which tries to thrash out within the medical community based on scientific expertise, but also with the patient experience to put together policies and documents which make sense for everyone, that focus on the, on the science, but also, most importantly, on the patient's journey. And therefore, it won't surprise you to see that these lung cancer essential requirements, we've done these for other tumor types, we've done them for breast, for prostate, for colorectal and melanoma. You'll see there's a great emphasis on uh, the multidisciplinary team and the patient journey. And you see in that graphic on the left hand side, you know, the, the, the team members who are core to a patient's journey um, after they've been diagnosed with lung cancer, and then the extended team, which needs to be available if required. And these essential requirements, which will come out in the autumn, they are to explain what the organization should be, what should the action be, what should the journey be, particularly thinking about timelines about educational needs, but also about an audit of outcomes. And I was interested to see in The Economist report, this issue which Marina was talking to just now, Dwayne, about the, the time from diagnosis to treatment often being so long. Some of those stats in the slide just earlier before Marina's question are shocking. And then there needs to be work done on that. You'll see some uh, aspects of that same issue um, about early diagnosis and referral to treatment timelines in our new essential requirements when they're published. You'll also see, and I've captured it there as an example, the issue of metrics. Uh, we've been in all of our advocacy work with MEPs, with Stella Kyriakidis, with Matthew Schuper on Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. We've been advocating for the need for KPIs and a dashboard to be able to measure the success of, of different initiatives in different types of cancer. And we, we here are saying, or we will be saying when the uh, requirements are released, what kind of performance and quality indicators are required by lung cancer centers to be able to measure their performance. And that measurement issue is, is one that will be working on together and I hope that everybody involved in this webinar today will be able to join us as we develop these essential requirements because these essential requirements that word essential is really important this isn't a gold standard this is what we think should be the lowest standard the essential standard for quality cancer care delivery 
in lung cancer. And we know, and I know you're gonna talk about it a bit later, this issue of stigma, this issue about early diagnosis, all of these make lung cancer somewhat of a unique tumor type. And, and it means that it's, it's an excellent area of focus for the MEPs that are part of the Youth for Health on the cancer, MEPs Against Cancer, the, the new special committee uh, for beating cancer and the uh, intergroup as well. So we're looking forward to working with all of those groups on when these essential requirements are published in the autumn. Uh, they'll be published in the Journal of Cancer Policy. And one initiative I just wanted to say, Dwayne, before finishing is we are going to be launching in the autumn a code of cancer practice, which is 10 rights for citizens on what their patient journey should look like. They've had the trauma, the distress, of finding out they've got cancer. What that should they be looking for in their patient journey? And we'll be releasing that in September. And I, at the bottom there, you'll see that there's a couple of other initiatives that we're doing in our networks and our summit in November. Um, you, can, you can find out more at europeancancer.org. I'm happy to take questions later on. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, Professor Garasino, um, you've seen what Mike has laid out here from the standpoint of key performance indicators. Do you have any advice or any other recommendations from what you see? What do you think these should be? And is there anything you'd like to see included as well? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So the, the concept is that in 2020, you can't treat lung cancer alone. And this is crucial because many uh, centers uh, treat uh, lung cancer just because they have one of the, of the people of the multidisciplinary team. But in 2020, if you want to get uh, a very good diagnosis, you have to, uh, you, you need at least the thoracic surgeon. And it is important to underline that the number of cases operated per year are surrogate of survival. So there are still many thoracic surgeons around the Europe that they operate lung cancer without enough expertise. So this is, in my opinion, a very important uh, uh, indicator. The second point is that many pathology centers do not have the molecular biology enough uh, to perform uh, the NGS testing required uh, in 2020. So again, uh, you need many people and uh, you need uh, qualified people. For uh, the, um, the therapy, when uh, you decide the therapy that can be targeted therapies, uh, chemo immunotherapy or immunotherapy, maybe the treatment can be done uh, locally, but the diagnosis uh, and the decision on how to treat this kind of patients must be done in 2020 only in a place where there is at least the core multidisciplinary team. So I totally agree on what Mike said. I think that, uh, and I hope that also the European Parliament endorse the idea that only the center with a multidisciplinary team can uh, give the, um, the, the therapies for these patients uh, and can uh, uh, do the correct uh, diagnosis. Because still now we see a lot of people without uh, um, diagnosis done correctly and or people operated to, to thora from thoracic surgery uh, that operates maybe three cancers per year and they are not uh, uh, enough trained to, to do the job. You know, Dr. Regina Herzlinger from Harvard in her book, Who Killed Healthcare, talks about this, these sort of specialized centers. She's very much for that. That's one of her large initiatives. But as you know, Professor uh, Garasino, this is a politically fraught issue. <laughs> You're talking very heavy internal politics. As a practitioner who's also then in Italy, What's the practicality of getting over the bureaucracy to do this? I mean, that's going to be very challenging, is it not? Yeah, so I think that uh, uh, one very good example was done from the network of the rare tumors. Uh, you, you are aware about the European reference, reference networks. And I think that this kind of initiative, they work very well because you select some centers 
that are able to give opinions, first opinions or second opinions, and then all the patients can be treated locally, but the indication to the treatment must be done correctly, in my opinion. Because just in the last two years, we have seen, for example, we had in 2004 just EGFR mutation, in 2007 ALK, and now we have about 10 targets. So if you miss the target, you change the life history of this kind of patient. So it, you can create a system that, uh, for example, in Italy is uh, done uh, not uh, formally, but is, is very well working of uh, a sort of hub and spoke. So this, the, the peripheral centers are happy to receive the second opinions uh, of uh, uh, biggest centers and they can treat the patients locally, but they are not equipped enough to to do proper diagnosis in 2020. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. I'd like to, again, there's more we could touch on, but we do have a few more questions to get through. Uh, Tommy, I'd like to bring you in and discuss, you mentioned stigma early in your introduction, stigma around lung cancer. Um, in your perspective, how big is the stigma issue? And what needs to be done to ensure that all the people with lung cancer are treated with compassion and dignity, and we get around this, so we avoid the stigma and actually just look at the treatment? What do we need to do, Tommy? In fact, we have already done something in Luce. We have a survey going on from among members, and it, I think it's closed now, but we, we are going to, to analyze the result, and we're going to present it to the, to the MEPS uh, against cancer, for instance, uh, in November. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see. But we, looking back, we have done surveys. Uh, we, I, I know surveys. The first one was two thought. 2013, I think, and that wasn't very <laughs> uh, nice to see what, what people think about lung cancer patients, if they had to value what patients uh, who should uh, get the best care, if you had to choose, if you, you, choose the, you didn't choose the lung cancer patient because they had to blame themselves. This was 2013. And I, I was, I think the word. I mean, can, can, I'm sorry. Can we just clarify that the result of the survey was that people who were surveyed thought that lung cancer patients should not receive treatment because they were personally responsible. Can we just? I, I just want to make sure I got that correctly. Not they should be treated after, not not only first. Uh, the, the, was okay. To put it back back in the line, not to have no treatment, but uh, back in the line. Well, that's unbelievable. Yeah. MEP Gammon, what's your opinion of that? Is, is this your, I've, first I've heard about that. I mean, uh, that seems terrible. Yeah, to me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's horrible. Um, and, 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 that's but, 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 but to, just to, to quickly comment, I mean, um, th there, is, there is in general that that is very often the problem with uh, when you say like who, um, how, how responsible um, are you for your own actions when there is a system of or when there is a number of policies that politicians, for example, are not willing to do when there is, um, if I look at, for example, numbers um, of, um, Austria has really bad numbers when it comes to young people smoking. It's horrible. It's a, it's a, we, have, we have the highest number of teenagers smoking. Uh, and, Austria, and, Austria and Switzerland, by the way. Both. Yeah, and, and yes. I'm just saying like, point me to anybody who would say that it's the kids fault that they start with that that is just really bad policy making and I think that it is appalling if a large number of people would say that people are responsible for that themselves it's a system that is in place where we have known better for a long time we have known better about policies for prevention and still yes there are many member states that are not doing their best in that so it's really important to communicate and to raise awareness about what we are not doing to save lives. And it's really, it's never the patient's fault. That's, that's fine. Tommy, I want to come back to you. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, forbid selling cigarettes. Forbid. Well, but, is, but isn't it also then a conflict because the governments are taxing them and making revenue off them as well? Yeah. There's a conflict there, naturally. Yeah. When was this survey committed? When was it done, Tommy? That's very interesting. It was made by Fritz Mori and it was worldwide. But I, uh, if I figure on the European countries, it was, um, it was uh, I think, 
that what hushes on on smokers in Great Britain. Yes. They were more tender in all, uh, countries that started with S in Spain and Switzerland and Sweden. Uh, more forgiving in those countries. But, the, but one thing we bought this uh, investigation was that even GPs thought like that, put lung cancer. Oh, wow. That's unbelievable. Mike, you wanted to come in and please. Yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, just to support what's being said here, I mean, one of our key members in this area is the European Respiratory Society, ERS. And they have an approach which is like you know, a double whammy to go for the prevention, the tobacco control, all of those messages, which are so important. But for those people that have ignored those messages, not to treat them as stupid and yeah. not, not to treat them in a way that they kind of deserve, deserve it because they weren't listening to the prevention messages. It's a combination here. And that's certainly ERS. And I know Lung Cancer Europe have been working on, on that kind of message. There is prevention, of course, of course, that's the, most important message, but treating individuals, as Claudia was saying, as idiots is, is not the way to solve this. No, or even from the practitioner side as well. Uh, Professor Garasino, are, are you, were you familiar with this study that even practitioners said that uh, we shouldn't be treating uh, smokers? No, so I, I don't agree with this. <laughs> well, we're glad to hear that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I, I think that uh, we have to fight the smoking, uh, when, in particular when the people are teenagers. So I agree, I agree. So we have to start from the beginning because if you look at the cinema, we have so many examples of uh, actors smoking and uh, um, so we have a lot of passive uh, advertisement for the young generation. And I think that all together we have to fight the dependency and we do not have to condemn the dependency because it's like other dependency. We have to cure the dependency and to work all together against the dependency. So um, this is my vision. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to point out to everyone again, we have a few questions that are coming in. We will have a few minutes to take your questions. Please uh, go to the question bar, submit your questions, and I will start filtering them in as we get through. We're, uh, we're almost done with our prepared questions. So please submit them now and I will answer them as they come in an order. Uh, again, Professor, just to, um, for, oh yeah, Claudia, did you have a comment again? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly say something. What I think is, is, is strange uh, on that study uh, anyhow is why does it matter whose fault it is? I do believe that we have a responsibility to save every life where we have the possibility. That's just a, a, a humanist approach that we need to take to medicine. It is, that is civilization. It, it doesn't even matter if it's anybody's fault. Well, we've had we've had attacks on big, you know, on, on big tobacco. Now we have attacks on big food and <laughs> big fat and everything else. You know, um, I think it's just human nature. I mean, Tommy, um, from your perspective, or do you see this changing, or do you think it's hardening these opinions? Mm, yeah, <laughs> I see both. In fact, so it's yeah. it's, it's very divided in this society. So, I I, I hope to, I hope that. Uh, the good side wins. Yeah. Well, I was I was shocked when you mentioned that. That's so why I wanted to clarify that. Thank you very much. So we said we went down a tangent a little bit, but I think it's a very important point. Um, Professor Garasino, you just had a Lancet study published. Again, congratulations. I'd read the preprint and I went back and read it again. Could you please pair the, uh, share the findings of that uh, Terravolt study um, that was published in the Lancet that looks at the impact of COVID-19 on cancer patients, please? Yeah. Uh, this is a global study we started uh, you know i come from milano so milano was uh, in march was the first uh, uh, city hit by the pandemic so we started to collect the data and uh, what it is interesting is that the lung cancer community of uh, cancer physicians and cancer oncologists we are very united everywhere and so we started to, um, to collect the data on, uh, cancer, on lung cancer patients uh, with COVID-19 because uh, we had the sensation that uh, due to the comorbidities, uh, this kind of patients uh, were, were more frail compared to the other, to the general population and also to other cancer 
population. So uh, we, call, we, we pre, uh, published the data on 200 patients, but we have now more than 1,000. And uh, what we saw is that the mortality of uh, thoracic cancer patients is about 35%, which is very huge. And this is uh, independent by the country so, and also from the surge. So it's not uh, driven by the surge and by the number of cases of the country. So this is uh, a cancer mortality, a, a COVID mortality by itself. And in ASCO earlier this year, they presented also data coming from another important registry, which is the CCC19. And the lung cancer mortality is 35% compared to 13% of all the other cancers, suggesting that potentially this kind of patients, they are more frail compared to the other cancer patients. Maybe for the cardiovascular comorbidities, for the older age, for whatever, but the mortality is very high. So we believe that we have to protect these patients, that these patients potentially must be one of the first to receive the vaccine if it will come. And the other important points that we found is that uh, the, uh, there is no increase the risk for targeted agents and for immunotherapy, which is a very important point. And it seems that there is an increased risk for chemotherapy. So we, be, we are trying now to create a score of uh, risk of death in order to create uh, some uh, uh, more rational guidelines for the future to treat uh, these patients. That's great. And the, so the study is ongoing and you're going to continue building up the numbers in the data set. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Can, if people who are interested in participating in the study, could they reach out to you then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I am the, the principal investigator of the trial with Leora Horn in Vanderbilt in Nashville. Oh, and, excellent. Yeah, and we have uh, uh, patients coming from Australia to US, to Canada, to Europe, everywhere. So I think that it's a global effort, very important, and also a very nice human collaboration. Thank you very much, Professor. It's very interesting. Unfortunately, uh, MEP Busoy had to leave us at the bottom of the hour. However, we still have MEP Gammon, who can speak, of course, for the August Institution of the European Parliament. And uh, we do have some questions coming in. Um, as I mentioned, MEP Gammon, I did want to discuss this point about how practically are we taking the recommendations that are coming from the European Parliament, working with the European Commission around the European Cancer Plan, and how are we moving those into the member states? How is that acting practically? Practically, um, I guess we uh, as European policymakers also have a responsibility to lobby um, for these recommendations also um, in, in our own member states and other member states. Um, it is up to, up to the member states themselves to, to make these decisions. They have a strong support from the Commission uh, in terms of recommendations, also what they should implement. Um, um, and not just on a, on, a, on a global level, but very particular to their healthcare system, what do they need to do? And then again, it is also a question of, of raising awareness. For example, um, um, the Austrian oncologist uh, Tilinski, he's very active in um, improving, especially the training and treatment availability um, in uh, uh, Southeastern Europe that has been an area where he has worked on for the last couple of years. And this, for example, is very important for us to, to have as information in the European communities so that we can pass it on to policymakers that then are then responsible for drafting these laws. Um, the new uh, subcommittee in the European Parliament is an important step to uh, to keep the pressure on this topic, because what really shouldn't happen is now that we have the momentum from, from the new commission, from the focus that they set particularly for, um, on this issue, that we don't lose the momentum now, but keep pushing for this to happen and to use the European Parliament as a controlling a control instrument to see how the progress in the member states is going and to more or less also keep them in check. And then the question is how 
active can we be again at some point and also you know hosting events having a debate um pinpointing to these very specific issues in the member states because i saw there was also a question from an audience member on on um the different levels of treatment that there are or availabilities of, of treatments in different European member states. And I think this is particularly something where we as the European Parliament cannot stay silent because I think it's, it is the right of every European to have the same high level of, of treatment and care across the entire European Union. I think that is just not very much unbearable actually to, to to know that there are patients in other parts of Europe that might have, do not have the same access to, to the treatment that they need as they have in other parts of Europe that really shouldn't be like this. And so it's making sure that people know of that, putting the pressure on, but then again, then it's up to the member states themselves. Thank you very much. Um, completely agree. If you look at, say, the CAR-T therapies, where we've been doing a lot of work, um, in two-thirds of the member states, they're currently not available. And these are the best-in-line treatment for refractory lung cancer. And yet, they're not available in many top-line member states. If you look at several countries on oncology products, it's taking over 500 days for them after they're approved by the EMA to have access in France. I mean, these are terrible statistics, but yet it's the reality of the situation in which we currently live. Um, I've got a question here from Thomas Metcalf. Thank you, Thomas. And this is involving us tracking the different types of cancer using real world evidence. How important is it, uh, how important do the panel think it is to systematically track diagnosis, including the molecular variant, patient treatment and patient outcomes on lung cancer in order to understand which treatment works best in the real world? So are we doing a systematic database capture across multivariant databases in the EU despite GDPR? Uh, what do we need to do there? Who wants to take a bite at that? Mike, you're looking rather pensive. I'm going to throw this to you, sir. <laughs> what do we, are we doing anything like this? Well, uh, I, I, uh, I'm not a medical expert and Marina, I'm sure can answer well on this, but the big work, the big issue of data and GDPR is a huge one. I know the cancer mission have been in their initial uh, interim report have, have been talking about this and the patient's right to own their own data and for that to be available across borders. I think that that's a, a really important thing. But I, I think in the question there is this issue of, of measurement. And your question just now to Claudia, I think is very relevant because this national competence issue is going to be an issue. There's big, big noise about Europe's beating cancer plan, what's going to be in it, and what difference is it going to make on the ground. And we, at the European Cancer Organization, we've been advocating that under these headlines of prevention, early detection, quality cancer care, quality of life, should be roadmaps for member states. This is best practice, this is what it looks like, and this is how to measure it. So there's some sort of agreed dashboard, even if it remains the national competence, there is a roadmap and a dashboard to be able to measure the success um, or realize where there are where there are gaps. And we think that that's the route to take given all of, all of the politics of this. Of course, on the back of COVID, what we're hoping is that the EU really steps up and uses this opportunity of the Beating Cancer Plan to make a real difference to citizens' lives across Europe and and we think that's the way of doing it, measurement being a key part of it. That's great. Um, Professor Garasino, um, do we have any sort of unified database or shared data where we're looking at the various genetic mutation types, et cetera? So there are some efforts at the national level, but the GDPR is becoming a big, a big topic. So. I totally agree that we need the real world data because from the clinical trials, we have uh, uh, some important information, but we miss uh, some uh, categories. For example, the, the performance status low, they are generally not represented in the clinical trials. So we need more uh, data. The problem of the GDPR is big. Yes, agreed. Um, boy, we've got a bunch of questions coming in now. Thank you very much. I'll try to do my best to filter these to the panel. Um, we have a Guidas de Silva. Uh, one of the speakers alluded to the awareness journeys made from breast cancer in Austria. That is today a disease area with high visibility awareness. Are all tumors born equal in visibility? Is there any learning we can take to accelerate awareness for lung cancer compared to other cancers? 
that's a really, uh, Tommy, that's really, I think that's up your street. What do we need to do? Why, how do we make one, why, we've talked about the stigma. What do we need to do to increase the uh, visibility of lung cancer, Tommy? We had to, we had to educate GPs. I think that's uh, the only way to go because um, uh, there's a lot of patients that go to GPs uh, many times. I have, I have uh, friends that have been advised, uh, what do you call that, uh, different therapies, uh, psychic, psych psychological therapies, mindfulness, mindfulness, I was going for mindfulness, instead of just keep, get a simple x-ray that could probably save lives for them because uh, they, they come to light too late specialist specialist care many patients and if you don't can uh, 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 diagnose as early as possible it, it's it's bad for the patient you should be d diagnosed as soon as possible and that's goes for all cancer and lung cancer is one of these cancer that you can have different symptoms okay if you start to cough blood you understand that something is wrong but you can be you can be tired and you can be other things uh, and other, other symptoms. So if it should be so easy to, to for just, uh, I don't know what it costs, five, five uh, euros or 50 euros or something for just a simple x-ray would help a lot of lives. And we have x-rays that is not expensive. And there were x-rays over, over everywhere. Just that little thing would save a lot of lives, I think. Thank you very much, Tommy. We have a interesting question here from Kristoff Jakubiak. Kristoff Jakubiak. I hope I got that right, Kristoff. Please forgive me if I did not. Could you please comment on the issue of how efficiently and objectively to compare new therapeutic, therapeutic options that come up every year? How do we prioritize them? How do we choose the real breakthrough therapies among many new options? Uh, Professor Garasino, I'm gonna throw that to you. How do we, how are you comparing new options for lung cancer? Lung cancer is notoriously difficult to treat. We've had crizotinib and several targeted therapies. Um, how do we compare the effectiveness of these treatments? So what we know uh, is that uh, you potentially can divide uh, the tumors into big categories. One uh, is uh, with driver mutations. Uh, that means uh, some genomic abnormalities. When you find the target, uh, you can have uh, the targeted agents. And in general, the majority of this kind of uh, um, of drugs, they have an activity in about 70% of uh, uh, the patients compared to 25% of the chemotherapy. So here, the, the, um, it, it is quite simple to, dis to decide what to do. If you, if you have the target, you have the targeted agents. Then uh, outside the, 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 the patients with the genomic drivers, we have a, a very big group of patients who can be more or less sensitive to immunotherapy. So here there is the big decision because what we know is that now combining chemotherapy and immunotherapy is a good way to treat all the patients. But, uh, we still miss uh, the biomarkers uh, to understand who are patients who are most likely to benefit to immunotherapy or not. And so here we need uh, more research and more connection among uh, all the people. So this is the gray areas, but when you have the target, uh, you have the right drug in general. Thank you, Professor. Um, we have a question here from a Harriet dog and it just jumped around on my sheet. There we go. What do the panelists think can be done to improve equity of access to lung cancer treatments? We were discussing this earlier. Patients in some countries are able to access new therapies much faster than others. What do we need to do to rectify this? Mike, um, unequal access to treatment. Obviously, this is a, a key issue. What do we do? Yeah, I mean, we know from Stella Kyriakides, don't we? And I'm sure everybody, everybody who saw the launch of the Beating Cancer Plan knew that this inequalities issues was, was central to um, to what the beating cancer plan will be. And we understand from DG Sante that every aspect of it will have inequalities there. But inequalities is a big topic. Um, and some of it relates to taxation. So it's a sensitive politically topic. 
Some of it relates to discrimination. Some, certainly some of our members believe that the fact that lung cancer screening is, is uh, less available than other kinds of screening is uh, not fair um, and is, is some form of discrimination. You've got a big issue uh, in healthcare about inequalities between East and West. You've got it on gender issues. You've got it on ethnicity issues. You've got it to do with sexual orientation. There's a, within cancer generally, there's a, there's a lot of inequality issues there, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this is tackled. It's back to, I think, what is best practice. If we can say in the beating cancer plan, what is best practice, then member states will have to measure themselves up to that standard and be judged by it. Thank you, Mike. Claudia, quickly, just what do you think we can do from a parliamentary perspective to try and promote this issue if we're looking at this from just the parliament banging the drum and being an advocate? Well, yeah, that's what we do every day. But I think then it's also important to, I mean, I, yes, having the European Cancer Plan also combined with uh, with, road, with a roadmap and a dashboard for member states would be a really good idea. And if you really want things to happen and get it done, there needs to be some money reserved for investments that might need to be made to really achieve that goal. Well, there's that nine billion from the commission. Who knows, maybe we can see some of that be put to use. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost out of time, unfortunately. I, I know that sounds hard to believe that this, uh, this hour has gone so quickly. But I do have one final question for our panel. And again, if you could just answer quickly, just within 15 seconds, in, in your opinion, what is the key one key recommendation from the lung cancer report that you think is the most important to deliver immediately? What's the one quick win we need to deliver quickly? Tommy, I will start with you in 15, 20 seconds quickly. What's the one key deliverable we need to do? It's definitely let the patients in international le uh, uh, level for in lung cancer care and let them uh, help, help pa patient advocacy. I know in Sweden we have been very good with that. So we can be, sit, sit in the lung cancer register, etc., and in different uh, health care program for lung cancer. Let the patients in but the, the, because the patients want to be uh, to have the best uh, treatment. Thank you very much, Tommy. Claudia, from your perspective. Um, I think uh, well, all of them are important, but something that I that, that I found very interesting was the the focus on ensuring um, ensuring equitable uh, equitable no? oh, yes <laughs> the same access to to innovations in in treatment and to any innovation that there is in the field. Everybody should have the same access to that. Thank you, Claudia. And we look forward to working with with that in the Parliament. Mike, from your perspective, sir, what's the one quick win we can get here? The, uh, the time from diagnosis to treatment, it's very clear in the Economist report. Those stats are dreadful. Something needs to be done about that. Thank you. And Professor Garasino, you have the final word. What's the, what, what, from your perspective and the practitioner, what would you like to see done? Yeah, I, I would say prevention, prevention, and prevention. And then after prevention, I would say that we have to render the innovation available for everyone. So. This means that we um, have to give the possibility to have the right diagnosis everywhere and uh, to treat the patient very well according to the diagnosis. So translate the innovation in real life. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much for our audience. You can see the link for the, Inco uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit report. We will also be circulating the link when we write to everyone and put this out. We will be providing the link in our final email. Again, thank you. There were several hundred of you on the webinar. Thank you very much for the panel. Excellent. Thank you very much for your participation. And um, good afternoon. We call this uh, webinar closed. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>